Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Ion TV's new show, Being Muslim. Uh, every week we have special guests with us from different academic and professional backgrounds. And today we have with us Ustad Ibrahim to talk to us a little bit about Islamic education when it comes to children. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How are you, my brother? Alhamdulillah, I'm good. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, very good. Thank you. Jazakallah for having me here. So, uh, which part of uh, UK are you joining us from? Um, I'm actually very close to Birmingham from mm. Kidderminster. Um, okay, it's a small town, not too far from there. Mm. Uh, we have a very well known madrasa here uh, by the name of Madinat al Ulum al Islamiyah. Okay, mashallah, that's good to hear. And uh, how are you keeping during the, uh, uh, you know, these difficult times? Alhamdulillah, um, you know, Allah has blessed us with so many avenues, so many ways to mitigate the current circumstances. And we're all just getting through, aren't we? Inshallah, not too long until we overcome these difficulties. Mm. Mashallah. Mm. And so, um, as we know that... Uh, the, with, with the current lockdown situation, uh, many of the masajid are closed and we spoke about this about a month ago in our episode with uh, Imam Saleh. And mm -hmm. Islamic education it has uh, evolved, um, especially in the, in the last few months. Uh, but I wanted to take this session out to speak with yourself as an Islamic studies uh, researcher and teacher. Uh, and uh, do a little deep dive into uh, what Islamic education actually is. So if you can mm -hmm. uh, illuminate uh, myself and the viewers on that for, uh, if, if you can. So first of all, at the outset, I'd like to mention that, um, like you mentioned, we have to do a deep dive in order to understand what truly Islamic education is. Mm. Otherwise, it's very difficult. So I don't want to get too technical for my viewers. However, it, Islamic education, and it's usually translated with tarbiya, mm. is one of those terms which is very difficult to translate. It's like, uh, for example, hypocrisy and um, nifaq or a munafiq. So when we call somebody who's a munafiq a hypocrite, mm. they don't really fit in. And early translators of the Quran use that word. But, um, I mean, hypocrisy is very broad, whereas munafiq is very specific. It's somebody who internalize it and thinks that the rules of Islam are not applicable to him. Mm. But he then portrays that. Whereas a hypocrite would be just somebody who is not doing it right now, so it could be hypocritical in that sense. So similar to that, tarbiyah and Islamic education, they're vastly different. And again, also depends on the perspective as well. Here, for the purpose of this, this discussion, um, we want to see what actually Islamic education is, and more importantly, what is the purpose of Islamic education? Mm. So the, the adequate word that I used was tarbiya. Mm. This is espoused in the Quran itself. And the root is actually raba, which is to grow, to nurture. Mm. And Allah uses this word literally in, in, in one verse, in, in some verses as well. Um, the, the, the easiest explanation is when last mentions the Anbiya salam, that they did not call their people to serve themselves as in they didn't tell people to worship them and say, just follow my instructions and worship me. Rather, mm. they called people to kunu rabbaniyin, to become people of rabbaniyin. Mm. Now, this is strictly linked to the word terbiya. It's the same. In Arabic, obviously, the roots are very linked. Yeah. So what does it mean when they said kunu rabbaniyin bima kuntum ta'allimun al-kitaba wa bima kuntum tadrusun? Um, become people of rabbaniyin who are, you know, be cultivated from having, be mm. cultivated from having taught the scripture and internalized it um, and uh, studied it closely. So you, as we can see, there are two phases to Islamic education or, or in this uh, scenario, mm. tarbi. It involves not only learning the sources, but actually actively propagating it, cultivating others as mm. well. So this is the basis of Islamic education, whereas in the West, the, the Western conception of education, mm. you know, it'd be, you could lock yourself up in a library and just learn yourself and internalize it. And that would be some form of education as well, whereas that would not apply to tarbiya. Mm. So that's an interesting way that you've managed to categorize the, the difference. It sounds like the, the two categories are the academics, just the information 
that I can soak up. And because it is meant to be Islamic education, it is meant to penetrate the heart and just be more than just lip service or just something that but stays that's in your right. mind. Um, you know, very well, uh, good point that you've raised there, to penetrate the heart. Um, if we look at, into the purposes of mm. tarbiyah, then we can see exactly what it means. Now, there are actually three purposes to um, Islamic uh, tarbiyah. One, uh, one is obviously finding Allah himself. Mm. Um, Allah says time and time and again to look at what is around us. You know, do they not ponder and to mm. seek Allah through nature? Um, through the signs, the ayat in them. Secondly, is personal development. You know, this is how we cultivate and grow ourselves. And thirdly, would be to nurture others. And Allah says, you know, al Quran, do they not ponder over the Quran? And this is directly linking into tarbiyah, mm. into education. And these three aspects are so interlinked. And part of the issues, and uh, obviously we will get into that in a moment, of our system is that we have separated those two. Mm. And because we have alienated it, we've kind of made it um, easy for people just to take out each segment of it. That's why the issues don't make sense. Okay, I think, Jazakallah um, Khair for your explanation. So with this in mind, um, the Islamic education being not only the uh, what we are meant to learn, but what we are meant to be nurtured with, what would be the goal in uh, not only learning, but nurturing uh, the Islamic education within uh, not only ourselves, but also the, the next generation? Um, I think one of the pioneers in Islamic education right mm. now is Dr. Abdullah Sayyid. He's mm. um, done a wealth of research and for those who are really wanting to look into it, um, he's got a great book on Islamic pedagogy. Mm. And so it's done over, I think, like 10 years. It's currently, he is the uh, reader at uh, Warwick University. So he summarizes it very nicely. And um, uh, Dr. Tariq Ramadan also touches on it in his Western um, Islamic education book. So what, what, is, what, what they both identify is the problem of an Islamic education in the context of our current world right now. Because you have to go back all the way and see how Makatib have developed. Mm. So, you know, the first diaspora of Muslims that came to Britain, our elders, our, our parents, the first generation, they came and found this country to be very un-Islamic, unfaithful. There was no place for religion. Right. Mm. Uh, yeah. so they, they laid the foundations for the first maktabs, which we have. And, and that sort of worked then. It, it gave some sort of Islamic instruction. But the world has changed so much, right? Yeah, so, so I, I think we can, uh, I, th I think this is something that we all recognize that our elders yeah. uh, have done in establishing the evening or, or the weekend or even a combined evening and weekend yeah. uh, Islamic school, Islamic education system for the young generation. And I think many of us have to be thankful for that. Yeah. So, uh, so sorry, I um, uh, no, no, no. Uh, interrupted that's, your that's, point. Mm. That, that, that's so true. So, I mean, early uh, people who, the pioneers, you can say, mm. they, they had this man's mindset where we are only here, or we are here, but this isn't suitable for us or our children. So, um, you know, there was this, it, was, it was thought of as a temporary abode. And so, so they, they didn't really lay down the roots. Then the second generation came and they kind of inherited a lot of this otherism in them. And when I say otherism, I mean like, you know, when we view this, this other people in this country as the non-Muslims, you know, because they are obviously outwardly so different from us. Mm. And, and so it, Islamic instruction was therefore just to supplement um, what was lacking in our modern um, faithless schools. Mm. But we see this at a whole a new level right now. Um, we're seeing a rise of the, the rational sense right now. Everything is getting questioned. Mm. But our instruction has not really changed much, has it? I mean, I'm not sure if you remember how Maktab was in your days. Um, so uh, from my past experience, I, I remember it to be um, just growing up in the masjid, uh, primarily just taught how to recite the Quran and if I remember correctly maybe some du'as and um, and we did receive some lessons in the Bengali medium but uh, I can't recall 
uh, what exactly they were. Mm. That's that's exactly how my memories were. So like you know, praying how to uh, learning how to pray salah, mm. etc. Yeah. So it's, it was very um, you know all about memorization things. There was no actual uh, focus on understanding or anything. Everything was just wrote, wasn't it? Mm. So. So the instruction was, was there, but mm. it was very one face. It was not dynamic at all, and and then there was this deep otherism within it as well, which we will, uh, which I'd like to t- touch upon in a mm. moment. But I, I, it's not very. I mean, it hasn't evolved at all. I mean, within certain communities of the Brit of, of, of the UK, mm. it, it's very. It's, it's become quite uh, inclusive. Um, for example, it's taken elements of madrasa, first year madrasa levels. There are some nahwa and some grammar, Arabic grammar. That is taught, which is very good. So, and uh, j- just in other areas, sorry. Uh, j- just for our viewers' benefit, uh, those words that you mentioned in Arabic, those are certain topics that you'd expect to learn in uh, in in your actual uh, full-time madrasas for the. Uh, is it would that be the alim course? Yeah, yeah. that's the that's yeah. an alim course. When you go to an Islamic tra- traditional uh, madrasa and you do these six mm. or seven years course, so the first year is obviously. Um, where the child is introduced to rules of grammar, Arabic syntax, they call that surf and nahwa. Mm. Sorry, uh, I should have explained that. So these elements are actually taught in a lot of madhabs, believe it or not, which is very mm. good, isn't it? Because that mm. ultimately bridges a lot of the gaps and enables students to go on to madrasas easily, mm. which is very advanced and very good. And in, in, because obviously our communities are growing, aren't they? Mm. So this is something that should have been unheard of back in the days when I was growing up. Mm. At the same time, there are other um, areas, for example, in my area and others, it hasn't so much as changed much. In fact, because of the large number of increasing children, Muslim children, and the, the lacking number of scholars, teachers, it's become very focused just on the Quran itself, as in just reading the Quran once. Mm. A child has been taught how to read the Quran, it's viewed as the end of maktab. And if they do choose to go to madrasa, then, you know, mashallah, they, they then study the religion, whereas if they take the secular route, it's kind of the end of their Islamic education, subhanAllah. And it's, I mean, it should not be like that, right? Mm. So, when it comes to the, um, the, the maktab and the experiences that uh, both you and I have had and many others, do you think that, uh, you've mentioned that, that there, there is a change that has been happening. Uh, do you think that this change is happening everywhere or just in certain uh, areas? Because I would assume that um, it's, it's only really happening in concentrated areas or where there is a larger number of a Muslim population. Uh, uh, what, what's your view on this? Or your yeah, understanding? D- yeah. Definitely, I think it's happening very um, differently. So mm. you obviously have the communities that have developed, that have large amounts of funds in order to facilitate and um, fund such ventures, as well as hire um, teachers to enable all these type of learning. Whereas you have the smaller communities elsewhere in, um, you, you can say, very s- smaller communities with, where it's not available. So mm. the model on its own, I think, ha- is ha- hasn't changed at all, isn't it? It's, it's still a form of instruction uh, considered very basic. Mm. The form of instruction also is totally unchanged, even in our current um, crisis. Mm. Um, it's largely been carried over through Zoom, mm. alhamdulillah, um, because, I mean, one of the benefits of this crisis that we're going through, and obviously every fit and hides behind it, rahmah, mm. and one of the things you can no doubt uh, see that we're having such great forms of avenues and pathways for everyone to take up so many different courses. There are courses on tafsir, you know, Quranic explanations and exegesis, as well as intros into Arabic, some things that which would have been very difficult to do because everyone is confined pretty much we're locked down actually so because the form of instruction is now zoom it's very easy to then broadcast it onto everyone but um going back to the the form of instruction and, and the model itself has not really changed uh, what i'm trying to allude to is is you know how do we I mean, what, what is really missing here mm. i think that's what i'm trying to get to this relates back to the um, the, the definition of Darbi itself. Yes. Remember how I mentioned that there are three facets to it. Mm. Now, finding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
Uh, most of us, obviously, are born into a good, solid Aqidah background that you know, we've been raised into by our teachers and mm. our parents, alhamdulillah. So we do not really need to worry about our Aqidah. And then we have, but obviously, you, know, you can extend that to say there's deeper meanings and nuanced meanings. And then we have the second phase, which is development. And that is very broad and very deep, and includes the the spiritual development, isn't it? Mm. But the third one, the tarbiya, um, sorry, the, you know, the nurturing others, that is alienated. And that directly correlates and you know, should be included within the maktab models. Mm. Now, I know the first things are my viewers and everyone were thinking is, well, how do we train these little, um, little tiny little scholars to be, to become da'is? Mm. Well, it's not that, it's, it's giving them the perspective and the understanding how do we? How are we modeling them to see the world out there? Mm. And we give them just a set of instructions. We also, without realizing them, are creating this divide, this otherism, which my late professor Dr. Atullah Siddiqui wrote so beautifully in his last essay. And he said, you know, we always speak about the Western Orientalism, which is, you know, the the negative perception of Muslims in Western media, etc. But you know. There's also a, a reverse phenomenon that exists, this tendency to view the West as this negative view, this negative view of the West in the minds of the East, you know, art itself. Isn't it? but, but if we continue to do this, there will always be a divide and therefore we cannot interact with them. Mm. But what we need to do with our maktabs is imbibe into them this notion that we have to get along with everyone mm. and the value we teach them is that you know we do not you know they are not the other they are not it's not a matter of muslim and kafir mm. the kafir word is such a dangerous word because it doesn't actually describe everyone out there yeah. and obviously as you somebody who has studied islamic studies and elaborate on that if we just like to um, just tell your viewers what i'm alluding to here um so um, it sounds like, um, just to summarize, um, yeah. when it comes to the Islamic education, if I've understood correctly, uh, your view is that um, it's, it's not just education, but it is also the development of the students yeah. and also the Definitely. nurturing. And right. combining all three of these, if I've understood uh, you correctly, it should lead to uh, the young generation not necessarily being scholars, but being strong and confident Muslims where they don't view the world in uh, this is us, this is them, but they... Uh, feel, feel free to correct me if I've misunderstood no, you. No, no, perfectly correct. Okay, but, but it, it should lead them to uh, not only being confident in, in practicing Muslims, but be uh, contributing members of society where their Islamic identity does not clash or there is no difference uh, yeah. in, in practicing Muslim and doing this, in being a Muslim yes. and being a teacher, in being a Muslim and perhaps uh, in just you know, uh, working in, um, in, in the supermarket, for example. There is yeah. it's, it's to all bringing it in and becoming a one a singular identity and... Uh, being um, inclusive. Yeah. Mm. That's right. So, um, so, I mean, that's where parents really come in. Mm. And from a young age, because if you look at the ayah where Allah speaks of this growth, yes. Allah gives an excellent example and He says, What are the barriers that Allah has shown them from the God in Minghum? Sorry, we know what are the habit and faith and the Alayal Ma. I was quoting that the verse in Surah Kath. It does that what about so Allah says, You know, you sometimes see the earth lifeless, yet when we send down water, it mm. quivers and grows and produces every delightful climate kind of plant. Mm. So can you see how the word, essentially the word that is used here is tarbiyah itself, mm. um, obviously the root form here. It's talking about cultivation and growth. And the metaphor here is of a child, we need to grow them mm. culturally and develop them so that they're able to benefit others with this ilm that they then acquire. If there isn't this development, they mm. will, they can easily adopt, um, sorry, um, learn ilm and acquire it, but they, they will be unable largely to benefit others, okay. or 
they may only be able to benefit a small section of people and mm. and you know their that their dawa habits will be very um actions will be very hampered because of the fact that you know they'll be unwilling mm. or rather um, unable to interact with the larger community yeah. now our model and everything is actually based on you know what would have otherwise worked in a very homogenous community mm. a muslim community where everywhere islam is given you know like for example in our muslim countries you can hear the five you know the call to pray five times a day mm. so there's no need to always mention the name of allah in every in every sitting because whether it's a classroom whether it's at work university or the government it's it's based on an islam understanding isn't it whereas here it's it's day and day it's becoming more and more faithless it's becoming very secular and materialistic therefore there is this deep need and which is all, which also gives way and, and makes people mm. draw the line as well and think of them as the other but it doesn't necessarily have to be this reverse so hence this is a very heterogeneous it's it's a mix of muslims and non-muslims yes and so the only way that we can grow and to to nurture the the, mm. the the next religious leadership is to grow and nurture children who will be able to interact with mm. the larger non-muslim community and spread the message of islam in a very positive way okay that's an interesting point that you mentioned about the society um it sounds like the the fact that um uh, you know where, where our parents are from or where our ancestors were from where the society is entirely muslim um the 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 society the society it helps to uh, nurture and develop individuals uh, and and so this uh, islamic education is coming from all fronts if i've understood you correctly whereas in uh, over in the uk where we have um where the society is not islamic you're not hearing the adhan everywhere um the society itself is not uh, geared towards uh, developing and nurturing individuals to be strong Muslims, it sounds like there is an even greater responsibility to actually perform this duty. Um, as we know, um, parents are, I, th I think it is very important, uh, they, they hold a very important position and they are the primary educators of their children. And I wanted to uh, ask you, what is your view of parents and what sort of duty do they hold to educate uh, and nurture, uh, to, to borrow those words, um, the, the, the children? Okay. Um, so firstly, I mean, parenting, the responsibilities of parenting is mm. very, it's, it's not something that we really look into and prioritize, unfortunately, mm. whereas it holds such a great importance in Islam itself. Um, we always have a lot of lectures, and, and, and rightfully so, mm. but uh, the, the obedience to parents, etc. I mean, especially in our, in our current age, that really needs to be emphasized. Mm. However, fail to do to speak more about the rights and responsibilities of parents, because ultimately, they are the ones responsible for upbringing these very children mm. themselves. And so if the foundations are not set, then, then they, there is the, um, the avenue for them to grow and be unruly children and disobedient children, right? So can you see how they are both interlinked? So yes. parental um, upbringing always needs to come first before you can, we can speak about uh, the rights of the children themselves. So, um, for example, in the laws of in, in Nikah itself, mm. um, you know, maintenance and stuff. I mean, one of the issues that's also stressed upon the father uh, is therapy itself. He needs to provide. I mean, that is a direct right of the child itself, mm. and education. If that is not provided, the child can actually complain against him on the Yom al Qiyamah for failing to do that, obviously, if it does not have a good enough excuse. So it's of very utmost importance. And going, it you know, correlates directly with what we said in the first half that it creates this entire model of a human being. Mm. Um, I mean, uh, your platform itself, being human. Uh, being Muslim, sorry, what does it mean to be being Muslims and being human? Mm. This is exactly what it is. It's education, isn't it? Tarbiya. We kind of tend to think of it as one facet, uh, as in like somebody who's a scholar mm. and go to him for fatwas when we need. That is not what it is, isn't it? I mean, an insan al kamil, which the scholars always spoke about, the complete human, that is ultimately the objection of education mm. um, to be the perfect human who is perfect in every way, 
and his interaction with others and able to part his perfection with others. And this starts at home. Like one of the famous um, expressions, charity starts at home. Mm. It does not mean that we always prioritize our families. Mm. What that, I mean, that's what, how it's usually interpreted, isn't it? What that means is spending on charity is something that is taught at home first. The parents do it. And this is how it starts at home. And that's how they become selfless and altruistic children. Mm. So it has to start at home, definitely. Um, working at a madrasa, uh, where I teach mm. at, in a secondary school, um, I see that first and foremost, so there's this dichotomy, which is, you know, this manaki um, tendency to paint everything black and white, mm. mostly and cap. And that is wrong, because that disintegrates. and. It's, it's it it kind of insulates us from the whole world. This insular thinking is so bad because then we raise children who are unable to interact with non-Muslims mm. and hampers all our ethics. And all of that, they then end up being narrow-minded. Mm. So if you place them in a public setting, they're unable to, um, you know, have a good, lively discussion. Mm. If 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 you're if you're following what I'm saying. I, I think I understand uh, what you just mentioned. But I want to go back to an earlier point that you also spoke about, to, um, where you, you said the, that charity is starting at home, the children learn from the parents giving charity uh, rather than just simply being told. And I think this is a theme within um, psychology that is discussed, where um, uh, uh, children, they, they don't simply learn from being told what to do, but they learn by copying uh, their parents. By example, of course, mm. definitely. Okay. And this was also the practice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. I mean, psychologists, um, they, they, they tell us explicitly, mm. children learn through uh, with adults especially. They, you know, they learn more with their interaction with adults than with mm. their peers at schools. They, they imitate, I mean, you, I mean, how often do you see little children wearing adult slippers and walking around? They want to always copy, mm. they, they, and that's how they take behavior. So and that's why it's so important upon parents to imbibe upon them this true sunnah method and what is the sunnah method, and that's why mm. I'd like to come to um, right now. And, and, and that is the parents' responsibilities in parental upbringing, which has to be the, the Sunnah method. And if you look at the psychology or if, if you look at how parental advice is given mm. in contemporary, um, in, in our contemporary society, you see that it correlates so much with this with, with this Sunnah method. If you look into the Prophet Sallallahu Sunnah and how he himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam treated children, for example, and it's been Malik Radhi Allah um, the, the famous narration where he said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for over 10 years, he never once said, oof to me. Or he never asked me why I did not do this. Mm. You know, how many of us as parents can say that we did not ask our child, you know, why did you do that? Or rebuke him or call him foolish names like, you know, you fool and, and things like that. Mm. This is so contrary to the sunnah. And what that does, it, it kills their self-esteem and does not allow them to grow well. Mm. Mm. That sounds... Uh... It's a, it's a very deep point where education is just not simply about uh, the information, but I think we're now starting to hit where the development and the nurturing comes from. It doesn't come from simply being told to do this, uh, pray salah, uh, pray in the masjid. It comes from leading by example. Um, and I, th I think that, that that's why you know le leading by example. It's, it's a very well known phrase within uh, Eng uh, within the English language, because that is the way to teach others. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the discipline of children, as you mentioned, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he uh, when uh, Anas uh, was, was it Anas radiAllahu anhu um, that that was in his care for, uh, for ten years, and never rebuked him. And I think this is very important because when it comes to when it comes back to the children uh, to the education, it is a very uh, real reality where we perhaps discipline children in the negative way uh, and uh, discipline children in, in in such a manner that we may even perhaps be harming uh, their their development or at least harming their understanding of Islam. Um, 
Now, I wanted to uh, speak also about uh, the idea of uh, when it comes to Islamic education, a lot of children, uh, uh, sorry, a lot of parents, uh, they not only want to teach their, uh, or, or at least get their children taught uh, Islamic education, but they also have this, uh, uh, also want them to uh, become a hafiz. Uh, you. Now, I wanted uh, you to speak on this because, as you mentioned earlier, it's not just information uh, that is taken up. Uh, there's an entire set of nurturing and development that's required. And from my understanding of the way that uh, uh, that, that children become hafiz, um, there is uh, some of them, um, uh, again, I don't know how many, but um, they only <coughs> become hafiz uh, in name only, uh, if I may even say that and um, the, without really understanding the Quran without having that nurturing and that development to be a Muslim understanding Islam and not just simply reciting the Quran I wanted to ask uh, your your view on, on this issue and this is also something that uh, uh, you know I uh, am quite passionate about so first of all um, we have to understand that we are living in the age of mass um, proliferation of knowledge it's also one of the alamat of the ends of times yeah. the end of times uh, but specifically this um, relationship with the quran now i mean that's yeah. a very huge topic and we could we could even uh, be talking about that alone um, yeah. because it's so applicable as well like you rightly mentioned um obviously when we say by name only we don't just mean we know we're not taking away the the reward of yes. becoming half mm. subhanallah uh, I myself became a Hafiz at a very young age. Mm. Um, but my parents, my Asatis and my teachers, they always said, you know, you cannot just stop at becoming a Hafiz. And, and, and Alhamdulillah, you know, I always had the aim of doing more Alamiya and even more after that. But um, some of us, the reason some of us, some parents might just want their children to become Hafiz is compartmentalized. They might think, right, a Hafiz of Quran, which is the memorization of the Quran, might just be adequate enough, and I can say my son's going to Madrasa, he's memorized the Quran, right, now let's make it to a solicitor, mm. um, or a doctor, or an engineer, or an astronaut, or anything. Um, no difference to any specific field, of course. And so what that does, it, it plays into this dichotomy, doesn't it? It's mm. like a bit here and a bit there. It's not inclusive. We're always separating the two, and that should never be the case. Mm. Um, a colleague of mine, of mine, he, he did it. His, he did his Almiya and is now in Essex University studying law. And he says, Subhanallah, the way that the, the Islamic judicial system uh, mm. links and correlates with our own um, Islamic jurisprudence, it's it's so vast because a lot of the root of um, obviously the legal system mm. comes from the relationship the West had with early Muslims and Muslim traders and how they borrowed from um, early laws, as how the beginnings of the common law, etc. So you can see how it's able to. Um, not just acknowledge, but appreciate mm. the close link and the overall comprehensive view, whereas somebody who is just a Hafiz will never be able to make that link. And so for, for him, it would be compartmentalized always. Mm. But going back, um, I actually have a group of adult um, learners who are trying to memorize the Quran. Mm. Uh, we do it over uh, WhatsApp and Zoom. And one of the challenges I have mm. with them is that they're unable to give a lot of their times to the Quran. Mm. Now, um, obviously, as you can imagine, there are adults, they have families, they have jobs, etc. And what, one of the things they say is, can we not do it part time? And I said, well, the, the thing is, the memorization of the Quran is about nurturing the relationship. It is not really about an oral memorization of the Quran. Mm. And a lot of people assume it is so. Because if you look at the hadith, what does the hadith tell us? That you know there will be a lot of orators towards the end of the times who will not, you know, the Quran will not go past their throat. In other words, it will, they will not internalize it. Okay. So they'll have beautiful voices and they will recite the Quran, but they will not know what it means, or they will not act upon it, they will not either from ignorance or from pure unable to comprehend what it means. So th there's no relationship. Mm. So I tell them that you know you have to make a decision. You either wish to invest into the Quran mm. and become people of the Quran and thereby become Rabbaniyin, people who are scripturally um, acquainted, and that's what Rabbaniyin and, and the whole process of Tarbiyah is about, right? Mm. And it starts with the Quran itself and everything stands from the Quran. 
So to cut it at hips is is very dangerous because mm. unless, of course, we give them some form of instruction. Now they don't necessarily have to do the full alimiya. Mm. It all depends how much um, tarbiya we have given them or their teachers, teachers have given them, mm. or whether that's because now, alhamdulillah, we're starting to see programs which. Um, for example, I think a Sufa University, a Sufa Institute, they're doing a degree as well as an alimia combined. So, so by the time they are firing as alims and molanas, they'll also have a BA degree. So you can see how both the worlds are coming together, and that's mm. what we need to concentrate on. And it all goes back to your parents, what the decisions they make. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, our Islamic focus there is will always be behind. Obviously, mm. they can never be at the same level at as Brahma uh, student. But we always have to realize that even state schools, they require private tuition. And we need investment from our parents in order to push these children in, through the Madrasa system and through Islamic studies so that they're able to fulfill um, not just you know the worldly obligations, but the Akhirah as well, so they can achieve well in both worlds and combine them together. Mm. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, you, do, you um, when it comes to uh, sending children, uh, I know you spoke about adults, but also children. Um, you don't want to just simply uh, use the phrase "cut off" uh, at just hith, uh, as if uh, becoming a hafid is is just the first step to. Uh, I, th I think, um, as you mentioned, to become those rabbaniyin, those who mm -hmm. are. Um, how do you translate that word? <laughs> Before I, I lose my thought, it's it's it's, it's a whole um, it, it's a concept, mm. so or, or rather even a system. So yes. you can say those who are acquainted with the scripture mm. and who nurture others, who okay. first who first nurture themselves and mm. then nurture others. These are the people of Rabbani. So you can say a, a developed educator. Mm. Okay, so j just for our viewers, if you, if you do ever plan on sending your children to uh, become a hafiz. It is a noble endeavor and it is only the first step to becoming uh, one of these uh, blessed people who have that relationship and that connection with the Quran. This is this is mm. specifically why um, you know, in the Muslim world they, they would never send their children to learn, um, sorry, for hymns of Quran. Mm -mm. That would be something that would be direct with their children. And we have extreme examples. Children becoming half is at four, at five, at six. How? Mm. Because it would never, you know, they, they would. It was done something at home. Um, children would emulate their fathers and their mothers constantly reciting the Quran at home and teaching it. Mm. So they would just imitate them and naturally learn the Quran at home. So this was like, mm. it was basic. It was almost like for them in the some golden age, mm. as as easy as learning uh, the alphabets. Mm. But obviously, it's it's very difficult in our times. But the point being is that this is not a form of instruction. Rather, this is like a set of tools. So when they finally do engage with the Quran, mm. they can easily mention this Quran, like how when I was mentioning in the, the verse of um, Rabbani, um, sorry, um, of Nabat, how I went up to the verse in Surah Kahf because of the, because the, both the verses are similar. Mm. Because I'm a half, I automatically went over that. Mm. So as an alim, you can easily grab the verses out and you can almost do a mental survey of all the verses. So you can see how the Quranic memorization acts as a tool for mm. further learning. And like a springboard, that's how it's meant to be. Okay. Um, and yeah. uh, earlier on, you mentioned also, you mentioned even a colleague who, after studying the Islamic studies, went on to study law. So what would the goal of studying the Islamic sciences be? To become a scholar or, or how would they engage with the world, in, in your opinion? So that, that would go back to the purposes of the therapy itself. Mm. Like if, that, if that objective is fulfilled, they are free to pursue whichever career they want. And that objective, simply speaking, is to develop themselves and to be actively develop, developing others. Mm. Like, you know, Ta'lim al-Kitab, to be teaching the book, so, and, and that includes the entire Islamic sciences. Mm. So as long, as long as they are fulfilling that, that's, um, you know, whether that's within even medicine itself, uh, or within the legal system, or in other areas, can you can you see how? Yes. So we're speaking of a dynamically um, developed Muslim mm. who's able to uh, sit down and speak with others, mm. non-Muslims, and and develop the discussions mm. and see 
and, and you know, complement each other in terms of learning and progression. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen because of the way we've taken the the almost you can say we've taken the therapy out of education, mm. if I if if I must say that. Because, for example, the way we bring them up is this dichotomy, you know, this black and white of Kafir and Muslim movement at home. So we have to be very careful of, of that as parents. Uh, we have to be very careful of telling them about how white people do these things or how Hindu parents do these things. Because Islam is not tied to the Arabs or to the Asians. And our neighbors, if they are non-Muslims, we still have a right to them. Mm. We should engage with them. And when we engage with them, our children will see that. And there'll be this development and we'll be able to overcome this, um, almost, you can say, this suppression and this insulation mm. of being just around Muslims and can you see how yes. it our mm. interaction with them and hence um, hinders our our abilities mm. and our ability to mm, um, progress? Because, because yeah. I mean, what is a kafir? A kafir is not somebody who isn't a Muslim. For example, you can mm. take any famous person right now, and you cannot say that he's a kafir mm. because that would be somebody who is directly refusing to believe in Allah and His last day. Somebody who has faithfully, I mean, a lot of scholars say, somebody who has in good faith has received the message of Islam. If somebody who is just not received, or for example, has only learned about Islam from the media, uh, which is, you know, it's a, it's a negative stereotypical understanding of Islam, isn't it? Mm. So we, you know, we can't say he is a kafir. Mm. So that's why it's problematic to even use that. Mm. So we have to be open to the idea that there is maybe a Jannah for him mm. if he does identify. We need to bridge that for him, and the only way to do that is to become developed, to be able to discuss with them, talk with them, and sit with them, and to create children who will do that as well. Okay, Jazakallah Khair for this uh, very uh, in-depth uh, look into Islamic ed uh, education. And uh, I just wanted to summarize a few points. Um, if I, if um, uh, when it comes to this idea of uh, becoming. Um, uh, just engaging with the world and having a, a single identity. It's, it's a way to be uh, uh, cross-disciplined within the Islamic education and the secular and making mm -hmm. it one so that whether you're a doctor, engineer, etc., you can bring in the Islam into it and uh, p perhaps be uh, e even be an ambassador to it as, as it is not something separate to your identity. Would that be uh, would that be uh, um, uh, correct in understanding what you've said so far? Definitely. Mm. Um, I think if you allow me to quote Dr. Abdullah Sahin, um, okay. mm. he actually, in one sentence, kind of paraphrases our entire discussion. He says, um, I mean, the purpose, the, the educational aim of the Quran mm. is to nurture an ethically responsible, critical, and open attitude within humanity, so that peoples of diverse cultures faiths and races mm. engage with a meaningful dialogue, dialogical process of learning from one, not one another. So can you see how mm. it's not about just keeping it within ourselves, but spreading it, because we have a responsibility mm. of parting this knowledge onto mm. non-Muslims as well. Okay. But lastly, um, I want to emphasize more on the parenting size. I know we didn't get to touch mm. upon that. Mm. And, you know, what are the responsibilities of, of our viewers, our parents at home? and Without um, rushing too much, I just wanted to say that first of all, what we need to do is need to we need to look into the seerah of the Prophet more. Oh, we need to acquaint us how did how was the Prophet because it wasn't just um, Anas bin Al Ali. There were several children. Um, uh, Sayyidina Ali the Alaihi actually grew up in the prophetic household. Mm. Uh, we also had Umar bin Abu Salama, who he, he said that you know the Prophet did not just tell me to do something; he explained it to me. Yes, he would say. Um, take the food from your side of the table, um, recite with uh, Bismillah. So we need to give them context, we need to give them, okay. explain them. So, uh, we just give them institutional Ustad, level. We need to tell them Ustad, why we need to do. Okay, so I, I do apologize. Uh, Jazakallah yes. Khair for the discussion. We are running out of time. Um, but uh, it's a bit an interesting discussion about what Islamic education is for and not only that but the responsibilities of parents in educating 
nurturing and developing the younger generation. Uh, it's, it's a shame that we've only had a limited time, so uh, maybe we can bring you on another time in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, th that is all today, and uh, Jazakallah Khairan for that. And we will, uh, uh, inshallah, be back next week on uh, Saturday from 3 o'clock uh, with another guest. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.